It's 11.38 on a Wednesday night. And you get an alert that another order transaction has failed to roll back. You fall back asleep, but make a mental note to investigate as this was the third time this month. And this issue can no longer be ignored as transitory. During the next day, reviewing the logs and code for why some transactions fail when rolling back turns up little. A couple of potential candidates, but far from definitive. In hopes of finding the issues, you add some log messages at candidate locations and hope for the best. A couple of weeks later, the issue repeats. And reviewing the additional log messages provide little benefit to finding the root cause. Worse yet, the additional log messages are cluttering up the logs and have a noticeable impact on performance. You stare exasperated at your screen, unsure what is causing the problem, and unsure how to even find it. Having a system that collects information on the state of the application and JVM that has low enough impact on system performance that can be always turned on in production could help here. Luckily for Java developers using the Hotspot or derivative JVM, that system already exists. The JDK Flight Recorder, Java's Observability and Monitoring Framework, which is the subject of this episode of Stackwalker. If you are interested in learning more about JDK Flight Recorder, other Java topics, or how to find a local Java users group, and more, be sure to check out dev.java, link in the description. The history of the JDK Flight Recorder is an interesting one covering multiple decades, JVMs, companies, and even names. But it starts with the fundamental issue brought up in the intro, the need for accurate and quality data covering the JVM and applications running on it. JVR initially came into being as a JRocket runtime analyzer, conveniently named for being part of the JRocket JVM, which was initially developed by Appeal Virtual Machines before it was acquired by BEA Systems in 2002. The JRocket Runtime Analyzer, JRA, was developed to measure the performance of JRocket in production settings. Soon after, JRA was provided under license to customers so they could use JRA to diagnose and fix their own problems. JRA was included in the release of JRocket, which was part of JDK 1.31. This integration happening back in about 2000 or 2003, like I said, multiple decades. Later, JRA was enhanced with the Latency Analyzer tool, or LAT, to provide better GC information for the deterministic GC part of the JRocket JVM. Finally, an always-on capability was added, and the JRocket Runtime Analyzer became the JRocket Flight Recorder, or JFR. Over the next few years, another series of mergers and acquisitions would occur starting with Oracle's purchase of BA Systems in 2008, and later Oracle's purchase of Sun Microsystems in 2009. There's always a bigger fish. With Oracle now having two separate JVM implementations, JRocket and Hotspot, the decision was made to merge the JVMs together. With Hotspot becoming the primary platform and key features being moved over from JRocket, this new Merge JVM was released with JDK 7 in 2011. A key feature for this video that was included in this merging was the JRocket Flight Recorder, which became the Java Flight Recorder. The Java Flight Recorder officially made its debut with the 7U40 release in 2013, though technically it was released as a non-functioning feature with 7U4. The next and final big moment for JFR and also final name change came in 2018 with the JDK 11 release when JFR was open sourced and renamed to the JDK Flight Recorder. Importantly, this also meant a commercial license was no longer needed to run JFR in production. JFR derives its namesake from the flight recorders used on airplanes, and the name was chosen because it fulfills the same purpose as a flight recorder a low overhead system that collects diagnostic and profiling data that can be used to find performance improvements or diagnosing crashes. Though hopefully when your application crashes, it has less severe consequences than for an airplane. The need to minimize overhead naturally drives a lot of the architectural considerations for JFR. JFR has a goal of maintaining a sub 1% overhead when using default settings, 
and even with a more substantial profile sightings, the overhead should remain under 2%. Though JFR can be extensively configured, and the performance impact can increase if extreme or unusual settings are used. Regardless, the low overhead goals are necessary because if turning on JFR led to a lot of additional overhead, or worse, change in behavior, JFR would offer limited utility. So let's explore JFR's architecture to see how it accomplishes its goals of having low overhead, minimal impact on system behavior, data can be self-describing, and allow users to selectively extract data. JFR is an event-based observability and monitoring framework. All the data collected by JFR is in the form of self-describing events, which should be able to be understood without additional context. JFR, as of JDK20, comes with 177 predefined events covering GC behavior, FlyIO, and more. Events like the file read event, one of the predefined events provided by JFR, is a good example of how events are self-describing. Inherently, all events captured by JFR will have a timestamp for when the event occurred and the event name. By default, the name would be the fully qualified class name of the event and field names the literal names of the class fields. However, this information can be overwritten or decorated with annotations. Describing the significance of an event or a field, categorizing the event, or decorating a value as more than just a number. How this metadata is used will depend upon the tool used to view a captured event. Here, in this example, using the JFR command line utility to look at a file read event, the only annotation used is the name. Also seen in the example are a few other pieces of information commonly captured. Duration, event thread, and stack trace. I redacted the data collected in event thread and stack trace as it would be too much to show. We will return to these fields in a few moments. However, returning to the subject of self-describing events, when viewing events in an analysis tool like JDK Mission Control, the other annotations are used the other annotations are used, like description. Label. And data amount. Which transforms the raw value in the bytes read field into a, an appropriate data amount of bytes, kilobytes, and megabytes, and so on. While JFR comes with over 170 predefined events, Ultimately, most issues developed or encounter will propagate from their applications, and here, creating a custom event will be highly beneficial. Returning to the issue described in the introduction, a developer could create a rollback event for tracking when a transaction is rolled back. A user-defined event can be created by extending the JDK JFR event class. Remember to use the annotations to make events self-describing. Timestamp and event name will always be included. But data like stack trace and thread ID are optional and can be disabled via annotation as well as by configuration file. Additional information can be captured in an events fields which can be of the type string, thread, class, or any primitive. To use an event in code, use the find or predefined the event would need to be instantiated. Values that you want captured should be passed to the events fields. If you simply want to record an event happened, then only commit part of the JDK JFR event API needs to be called. This would be referred to as an instant event. If you want to record the amount of time it takes a block of code to execute, then begin should be used. This would be called a duration event. Along with duration events providing you with how long it takes to execute a block of code, helpful for performance tuning, duration can be a useful configuration for controlling which events JFR captures. More on that in a moment. So calling begin will start a timer that will end when either commit is called or end. If the data being collected, if the data being captured might take up significant processing time, 
then it could be useful to call end before commit and place the event data collection between the end and commit calls so it's not included in the duration calculation of the event. Additionally, if the data capture is significant, it can be wrapped in an if block using should commit. This way, if JFR is disabled or the event is disabled, the code execution will be skipped. While adding an event to a method might look noisy from a code perspective, the begin and a commit methods are extremely lightweight, and when the event or JFR is disabled, the JIT removes the method references. Let's look at the process of how JFR stores an event once commit is called. Events, once committed, are flushed to thread local buffers. Once the thread local buffers are full, their data is copied into global buffers. What happens next will depend upon system configuration. If JFR is configured to write to disk, a global buffer is full, then the buffer will dump its contents to a JFR record file. If JFR is not configured to write to disk, the global buffers will act as a rotating in-memory buffer and when full, its contents will simply be deleted. The option to only have an in-memory buffer was provided because historically writing to disk was a relatively expensive operation. But more recent versions of JFR performed the write operation asynchronously. And with most hard drives now being solid state instead of disk, writing to disk has a trivial impact on overhead and in almost all cases should remain enabled. Otherwise, you risk throwing away the data that JFR is collecting. However, it would be wise to configure retention settings on data written to disk, which can be configured at JVM startup. JFR can be enabled with the JVM argument start flight recording. Start flight recording can take many arguments. For defining the recording file JFR should write to for data dumps, use a file name. JFR provides two key options for configuring data retention, max age and max size, which take values of seconds, minutes, hours, days, and bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, and gigabytes, respectively. For production settings, it's advised to promote a max age or max size as their defaults are unlimited. You might notice, however, if you try using JFR, that nothing is being written to the file name you provided. That's because JFR is writing data to temporary files. To have JFR write data to your recorded file requires issuing a dump with the J command utility, which can be used to signal JFR to dump data it has collected, which can be called if a system starts experiencing issues or otherwise retrieving data from the application it is deemed necessary. J command provides several other commands for JFR, including check for checking system status, Configure for configuring JFR, which provides equivalence for all the options available with start flight recording. Start and stop for respectively starting and stopping JFR. JFR does not have to be initialized on JVM startup, but can be started on an already running JVM, a very useful feature if an application is experiencing an issue in production and you want to collect diagnostic info on it before shutting it down. With 177 predefined events, plus user defined events on top of that, JFR can collect a lot of data. As a result, JFR must take steps to tightly compact this data and to prevent retention of duplicated data. Returning to our earlier user defined event, often when the rollback event is captured, the stack trace would be identical to previous instances of when the event was captured. Storing these identical stack traces as individual objects would use a substantial amount of space. To reduce this unnecessary duplication, JFR stores stack traces in a constant pool and it set a reference is made to the constant pool when an event is captured to that stack trace. JFR employs several other space saving features, including storing other values like string literals, class names, method names, and more in the constant pool. And for storing integer values, JFR will encode them in Web128. While JFR employs a lot of tricks to efficiently store data, ultimately the best way for users to ensure JFR is only collecting the data they need is to configuring how JFR captures events. Configuring the events JFR captures is handled through JFC files, which are just XML files. JFR provides two JFC files, default and profile. Users, however, are able to create their own custom configuration files. 
Here in this example, the rollback event shown earlier is being configured. For timed events, events using begin and end or commit, a threshold setting can be provided, where only events that exceed the threshold are captured by JFR, which more than saving on space, helps developers by substantially reducing the haystack of collected data to better find those needles of real problems. This configurable data retention is one of the key advantages JFR provides over alternatives like logging. The start flight recording argument then takes settings like in this example. JFR is a fascinating piece of technology that goes chronically underused in the Java community. Virtually all Java developers have or will run into an infrequent and difficult to diagnose issues like the example described in this video. And JFR is ideally suited for helping developers in those situations. Because it's capable of always being on production, its data is self-describing and users can configure what data is being collected. Still, we only have explored the tip of the iceberg that is JFR and we haven't even covered event streams added in JDK 14 and only briefly covered JDK mission control and the JFR utility, subjects for future episodes of Stackwalker. Until next time, have a good one.